Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending the International Myeloma Foundation's Living Well webinar, How to Optimize and Protect Your Immune System, a Nutrition Approach. We're all hearing about how critical the immune system is for our overall health. What is the immune system and how can we protect it? Can nutrition improve your immune system for better defense against disease, bacteria, or viruses? Can supplements help you? Well, tonight we're going to get those answers to these questions and more and understand how to take better care of your immune system. I'd like to thank our sponsors for their generous support of tonight's call, Bristol, Bristol Myers Squibb, Janssen on Copeptides, and Takeda Oncology. Our speakers for this evening are Sharice Gleason, a nurse practitioner in the Multiple Myeloma Program at Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University in Atlanta. She's also an adjunct faculty at the Nell Hodgkin Woodruff School of Nursing at Emory University and Chief Advanced Practice Provider for Winship Cancer. Sharice is a distinguished member of the International Myeloma Foundation's Nurse Leadership Board since 2008, serving to educate nurses and patients and to improve the lives of those with myeloma. We also have joining us tonight Stephanie Boyea, and she is an experienced oncology clinical dietitian, also at the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory in Atlanta. Stephanie has been working with Emory's multiple myeloma programs for the past 10 years, assessing the nutritional status and risks of patients with myeloma, as well as other malignant and pre-malignant blood cancers, as well as other cancer survivors. She provides diet education, nutrition counseling, and individualized dietary recommendations based on both patients and caregiver needs. She has a bachelor's degree in dietetics, and a master's degree in applied nutrition. So as you can see, we're very excited about our honorable speakers this evening and to have them join us on our call. I just want to remind everyone that we're, we're very grateful again to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb and Janssen and Oncopeptides and Takeda Oncology. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Sharice and would you please begin? All right, thank you so much, and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, today we're gonna to talk about optimizing the immune system, and how important is that? One, you know, myeloma is a disease that impacts your immune system, but also if you look at all of our new therapies that we have, how we're manipulating those, right, to work for you to help target myeloma cells. And we're not gonna really be talking about those treatments, but it really all comes together. Um, I've got Stephanie joining me today, and you know she's somebody I go to all the time. So we're going to have this interactive between the two of us, and you'll find I'm going to ask her questions that patients ask me as we go. So we'll talk about diet and supplements and nutrition and talk about COVID and how that has come about and some of those things this past year, as well as food safety. So the first thing, I'm going to walk us through our immune system a little bit. And Stephanie was nice enough to put these slides together and starts with an analogy that compares our immune system to a castle's defense, right? So you have a castle, you have those safeguards, so people you don't want to get in, right? Like a moat, like a um, the door, the... <laughs> the drawbridge, I know, I called it a door. The drawbridge. <laughs> Um, and then your soldiers. And so when I think of our immune system, you have this whole army within you um, fighting and their whole sole purpose is to stop intruders from entering. And so we're gonna walk through that a little bit and what does it mean for us, but what does it mean for you with myeloma as well? And so if you think of the, the immune um, system, we have what's called an innate immune system. That's that quick to respond, it's nonspecific, so they just target everything. Their total goal is to stop intruders, like I said, and they just attack. And they also look for rogue cells that aren't supposed to be there because our immune system is is very complex. And you know, we 
all might have that circulating abnormal cell or a circulating cancer cell that your immune system actually takes care of. But with cancer, and especially myeloma, you get this overproliferation of those cells that it just can't handle. Um, so quick to respond, then you look at the adaptive immune system, and that's also called the acquired. And that's where we think of T cells and B cells. And right with myeloma, a cancer that impacts your B cells um, comes into play. So these cells target in a little bit different way. They're a little slower to respond, but they're very good at remembering. They have these memory cells as well that remember. So if that same pathogen comes in again, they can remember and you won't maybe have quite that same response that you had before. And so their whole job is to work together in this complex system to take down abnormal pathogens, right? So what is our body's defense? You think of our skin, that's your first line of defense. The skin is the largest organ that we have. You think of mucous membranes. Um, your lung linings, your stomach lining, you've got acid in your stomach to kill abnormal things. Um, interesting, IgA is housed in those mucous mem membranes. You know, so if you are somebody that has problems with your IgA, you could have problems with that part of your immune function as well. With myeloma, you get this over proliferation of cells, plasma cells become B cells. You have an infection or a virus and they release these antibodies to go attack. And so it just doesn't work that way necessarily for a myeloma patient. So the other thing with your immune system is you can have this inflammatory response. And for a lot of older people as well, when your T cells stop working as well, um, you can have more inflammatory. And you can have these responses to dietary and environmental changes as well. And what happens with this is the body then produces free radicals. And high levels of free radicals cause more inflammation. Um, and it just simply isn't good for you and causes increased stress. And you think of foods, and Stephanie, you can help me out a little bit here, but I think of the foods that really, that you should avoid that release more free radicals are things like alcohol, high sugar, mm -hmm. so that high glycemic okay. index kind high of food, food. processed, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are the things. So frequently, you know, patients will ask, well, you know, I've got the dex belly, right? As we age, we also put on our weight around the middle. And so I'll frequently tell patients to eat, um, to avoid a white diet. Does that make sense in these circumstances? They say to, uh, they want to avoid the white diet? Is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, processed, white foods, white flours, white rice, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in some ways, yes, that's certainly pertinent in terms of, you know, when we're trying to help with keeping the body satiated, those white refined carbohydrates are going to be processed much more quickly which then is gonna spike someone's blood sugar that is probably on, if somebody's on dexamethasone, they're often going to have more exacerbations in their blood sugar spikes. So by avoiding those white refined you know, carbohydrates, they are gonna have better control of the blood sugar, which of course, if their blood sugar is higher, it increases inflammation. So it, it is a good thing to kind of try to implement, but. It, but I also, you know, there are other ways and tactics to kind of help combat all of that as well. And we're going to talk about that a little further down. Okay. okay. So what are those things that influence our immune system? So we know things that can weaken it. Um, smoking, it's just never good. Um, so there's, there's no positive around smoking. Can't sugarcoat that. Um, certain medications, we know chemotherapy, steroids, right? High dose dex, any dex, you know, makes you more compromised. Multi-drug regimens like we use for myeloma. Um, when COVID first hit last year, we went back and started reducing dex doses where we could, where it didn't compromise our patient's care because of that risk for infection, right? So we wanted to think that about that and protect our patients as we could. Um, you think of age, you'll see in the talk, lots of things revolve around as we age. Um, other underlying medical conditions. So what other comorbidities might you have that could impact your, 
your immune system. So things like diabetes, uh, obesity, other autoimmune disorders. And again, you know, myeloma is a cancer that impacts your immune system. So definitely that we know that pregnancy can also uh, weaken your immune system, malnutrition and excess alcohol. Now, the things that strengthen us um, are sleep, right? And, you know, now we're over here talking about the decks that weakens it. And then we're talking about how you need to get some sleep. But the fact is that we all do better with good sleep, sleep habits, and going to bed around the same time, having a pattern really helps. Activity, I mean, we all need activity. And, you know, if you have chronic pain, sometimes that's a little challenging, but walking, swimming, um, stationary bike, those kind of things, activity really helps with your boost your immune system and managing your stress. When you're stressed, what happens? You weaken that immune system. That's a time, how many times have maybe you had a, a virus or a cold and then afterwards, maybe you got a flare of shingles or that's the time that a cold sore hits. So those herpetic things that are lying dormant when you're stressed tend to come out. And the other piece is keeping that quality balanced diet. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that really, Stephanie is. Um, you know, I, I think for us with the questions we get from our patients, I think of things in moderation. You know, you if your entire diet is high fat, sugar, yes, that's, that's bad for you. You know, we get asked a lot, can I have a glass of wine? So, you know, you know a glass of wine, yes, a bottle of wine, no. So it's those things in moderation. You shouldn't have to give up everything. And we're going to talk more about the supplements too, because as you know, people come out of the woodwork with all these supplements that you should take this, it's good for you, and it boosts your immune system. So if you think about your diet from the standpoint of how it influences your immune system, you think about it as fuel. You can't drive your car if you don't have gas in it, right? And the same goes for your body. You need the fuel for energy and your system needs that to perform. So you think of that as nutrition. It's why we nag you a lot when you don't feel like eating or you can't eat big meals with those smaller, more frequent meals, because we know that you need that, tr that nutrition support. So how do you get that? It gives you that adequate energy, um, protein intake, um, nutrients, and this helps minimize inflammation. And there's a whole host of information out there that talks about anti-inflammatory diets and that we're not really focusing on that a lot. And Stephanie can certainly uh, speak to that, but you know, those foods that you can avoid that cause more inflammation. Um, you want to think about how you take care of your gut as well. And you know, with a lot of our medications and a lot of our treatment reg regimens, it really can throw um, that stomach for you. Um, and then hydration. We're both going to talk a lot about hydration because you need so much. We all do, right? And, you know, I ask patients, are you drinking? Yes. And then I see your creatinine <laughs> and maybe no. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about what are those things because it's more than just drinking water. You can get it in so many things in your diet. Um, but it should be happening throughout your day. So it's really essential and you feel a lot better. So diet, exercise, hydration, there's a theme here to keep you going, anti-stress. So if you think about your energy intake equals your caloric intake, right? So if you're not eating and you're losing weight, um, you're not gonna have the energy. And that's where fatigue takes over, and it's it's more than that, right? And I mean, it has to do with your blood counts and those things too, but you've got to feed your body to get that energy. So if you have an infection, your immune system gets activated in that way, it demands more energy and it will take it one way or another. So if you don't feed it, it will take it from your body reserves. And that's you know where we see patients struggling. So think about those things, if you're healing, if you've had an infection, a fever, inflammation, all those things, your body is telling you it needs more to help you heal. Okay. Well, and thank you, Cherise. So now um, I'm going to pick up from here. Um, so the next important thing when it comes to diet and, and the immune function is going to be protein. Um, I'm sure many of you have 
probably had many of your practitioners talk to you about increased protein, increased protein. Um, and at least now you can kind of understand why. I mean, one of the big reasons we talk about protein a lot during treatment is for muscle building purposes and to maintain lean body mass. But it's not, that's not its only role. There's another role that protein has that we often kind of overlook in the, how it impacts the immune system. Um, it's very vital for fighting viral and bacterial infections because our antibodies and other immune cells rely on protein and its amino acids in order to produce these antibodies. Um, so studies have shown that inadequate protein from our diets may lead to poor immunity. Um, so I know the most common question we get is, okay, well, what's protein? Um, so protein is gonna come from any of your meats, um, but we really, really wanna encourage when you're feeling well to try to choose those leaner proteins like this chicken, turkey, fish, lean cuts of beef, beans, tofu, soy, any of those. And then also low fat or non-fat dairy. Um, I did think, I think in one of the questions I actually saw somebody ask about dairy, um, asking if that should be eliminated. And, you know, that's very individualized. I would say as a catch-all, no, you know, just if someone has multiple myeloma, it does not mean you need to eliminate dairy by any means. Um, there are some people who don't tolerate dairy because of lactose. So they will have signs of lactose intolerance. There are some people who don't tolerate the protein of dairy and they would know that because they've probably had an allergy most of their lives. Um, and there's a lot of studies though. I know there's a lot of misinformation out there about, you know, there's a lot of information out there saying da dairy causes inf inflammation. Um, and then it's interesting when you look up the studies it's a lot more complicated than that. There are some studies that may suggest that dairy may increase inflammation, but the majority of studies actually have seen the opposite of impact. So it, at this point, no, there's absolutely no good reason for people who are tolerating dairy well to feel the need to eliminate dairy. Um, if there's somebody who's not, when I'm individually speaking with someone though, if I see that, you know what, you're not tolerating dairy, that's something different. And we will, you know, remove that and see if it helps. But um, outside of that, just if, you know, in general, no, not everybody needs to eliminate dairy. Now next, um, when talking about nutrients and inflammation and its impact on immunity. Um, it's very interesting how the Western diet has been shown to have an impact on our immunity. So the Western diet is essentially characterized as a diet that's high in sugar, high in trans fats, and high in saturated fats. Um, and then it's also characterized as being low in our complex carbs. So basically those whole grains, grains that are higher in fiber, um, it's low in micronutrients. So what that means is it's low in vitamins and minerals, things that are essential. Um, and then low in polyphenols, which are shown to be anti-inflammatory, as well as omega-3s, which is a type of anti-inflammatory fat, typically found in fish, but also walnuts and other foods as well. Um, but it's been shown that the Western diet is actually a risk factor for what they kind of describe as a metabolism-induced inflammation. And what does that mean? That means we have these high intakes of saturated fats and other inflammatory in, in, inflammation inducing um, you know, nutrients that then yields this chronic activation of the innate, innate immune system. What that leads to is basically the body is in kind of overdrive chronically requiring more energy from, in order to have this immune system chronically on and activated. Um, in doing that, it's trying to either take extra energy from our diet or our bodies. And kind of what Cherie's talked about before is, you know, those cells, they're always going to find that energy wherever they need it. So if you're not eating, and I see that we see this so often in our patients, you know, you have this already kind of, you know, stressor of having myeloma. And then on top of that, we see the chemotherapy and the side effects and taking that extra toll of not being able to eat, that's where we see this huge loss of lean body mass and weight loss, et cetera, um, because the body needs that energy and it's gonna get it from somewhere. 
Um, so next, you know, there's, there's a lot of data su to suggest choosing a plant-based diet. Why is that? It's because it's very high in antioxidants, meaning that it can have more of an anti-inflammatory effect on the body. Um, the reason for that is antioxidants. When we think back to what Sharice talked about when we were talking about the free radicals causing inflammation and that inflammation causing more free radicals, the antioxidants kind of help balance that out. They kind of help donate, you know, an electron to the to the angry free radical and calm it down. Um, and so that's where that this benefit of the plant based diet, high in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds. That's where we see that. Um, and a Mediterranean diet, it's just it's it's interesting because when I, we talk to people about okay, you want to implement a plant based diet. I think most of us picture a vegetarian diet. Um, no meats at all. And in reality, the Mediterranean diet is majority plant-based. It's the, the large percentage is plant-based fruits, vegetables, whole grains, all of those things with small amounts of fish, poultry, um, as well as even some red meat, but it's much more occasional compared to what we see in, in the Western diet. And also it's associated with reduced risk for heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, there's lots of potential benefits outside of just the immune system. Um, next, like Sharice said, let's talk about the gut and all the damage we do to that gut during treatment. But um, the gut, gut health is found to be important because we, we know the majority of body, the body's immune cells live in the intestine. And that's something that has just been so overlooked until recently. Um, the gut bacteria actually produces something called short chain fatty acids that actually help protect cells in the colon and um, may help protect against inflammation throughout the entire body. So that just goes to show how important that gut bacteria is. Um, how do we maintain that good healthy gut, including good, including probiotics? Those are those good beneficial live bacteria. You can get that in food. You can also get that in pills, forms of supplements, um, which could probably have its own entire hour long presentation on. But um, in terms of food, we really always try to push food before supplements. So you can get beneficial probiotics in yogurt, kefir, which is almost like, I really recommend that for people who don't love the texture of yogurt. A lot of people, if they say, oh, I don't like yogurt, usually kefir is a good, and I don't even know if I say that correctly, but, <laughs> but that's how I say it. Um, it's a good way to get that yogurt drink in because it's a thinner version of yogurt. And there's kimchi, miso, tempeh, kombucha, sauerkraut. There's lots of other options in order to get the probiotics in. You also need prebiotics, which are your non-digestible fibers that help the, the gut grow the good beneficial bacteria. So you need both. You can't just have one or the other. You need those really good healthy foods that are gonna help feed the good beneficial bacteria. Um, and I've listed some of those, but the artichokes, asparagus, bananas, essentially if you have a diet that's high in fruits, veggies, whole grains, you're gonna be getting these prebiotics in. Stephanie, I just, and we've got a ton of questions. I'm gonna let you finish up this and then we'll maybe go through some of these questions. As, but. Okay. The probiotic, um, what about when a patient is um, neutropenic? We get that question a lot. Can I take that, um, you know, when my counts are low? And uh, I know there are so many different types of probiotics. So that is a very good question. And I honestly think we don't have an answer yet. So, I mean, I know that I personally end up going to my individual teams, depending on the patient. I know I go to you, depending on the patient. Um, if somebody's counts are low, I know, first of all, I really try to weigh the benefits and the risk. There's always a potential risk because we really do not know that it's kind of interesting when it comes to probiotics. It's as if the, the market has really <laughs> gone far ahead of what we scientifically know and understand. So, you know, I really try to kind of save it as a last resort personally, um, and really try to weigh the risks versus the benefits for that individual patient um, and really kind of collaborate with the team on that. Um, Cause I think right now we just don't, don't know. Okay. And I think that's, 
that's a good reminder for everybody on some of those things that, you know, it's just not clear. And, you know, it's always good to go back to your healthcare team and ask them because things do yeah. vary from, you know, site to site. And, you know, we may do something different than All your right. team do. So it's always good to ask. That's yeah, exactly what I was going to say is every institution mm -hmm. certainly seems to have a different take on it. And I think it's because it's just this ever evolving topic. Um, yeah. So I do think it should just be, in, I think it should be very individualized. Um, and then also the fact that I'm always trying to push food versus supplements when able. So I think probiotic sources of food is a good place to start, you know, in those situations, um, since it's not, you're not getting such a large load of a probiotic at one time. Um, um, do you, you want, want to? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and ask you a few questions because they you had a lot of questions around the protein. Um, about so there were questions about the protein shakes and supplements, what your recommendations are or whey, which I think comes in a powder. And then we have a few questions around somebody who's a vegan who does not care for beans. So how you know some protein ideas? Um, so I guess I'll start with first. First question was. You mentioned the whey protein, like basically about shakes and powders. Shake, and supplement, yeah, those things that, that you would recommend for people. So I absolutely, for most people, if appetite is good and someone's eating well, you know, you can absolutely get by without a protein powder or protein shake. Um, it really, once again, comes back to being fairly individualized in that scenario. But most people, I think, find that I, I am big on always have a protein drink at least on hand because you never know if you're going to have a bad day and or just not feel up to making something that day or somebody's not around to help you that day. So, you know, I, I'm very big on you at least need, if you may not need to drink every day, you may generally feel OK, but I always want you to have it on hand. That way you don't have any setbacks um, in terms of of what types also very individualized. Um, I, I really do try hard to talk to patients and kind of get their history of what have you tried? What have you liked about certain ones? What have you not liked about certain ones? Um, how did you tolerate them to really come to what is going to be the best option for them? Because everybody's so different. Um, but definitely the gold standard, honestly, is a whey protein powder and when it, or a form of whey protein has been just shown to be the most bioavailable, most well-absorbed form of protein um, and has the most amount of research behind it. So if we have people, you know, going back to that dairy question, if you can tolerate it, you don't mind the taste, <laughs> and your GI tract tolerates it, I mean, I, that, that's usually the go-to for most people. Okay, and then you mentioned somebody who's vegan and doesn't care for beans. Beans, so how the protein source, and you know, we mentioned tempeh here, right? I mean, that is a source of protein. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that definitely makes it hard. I mean, I would usually say, it depends on if it's a, a, a preference versus a, I, my GI tract doesn't do well with beans, but um, I would say if it's a preference of, I don't care for beans, I would definitely try to, you know, tofu is an excellent source of protein and or pea protein milk is an excellent source of protein. Um, when it comes to, you know, I mean, obviously you can do nuts are a great source. Quinoa is a great source of protein that's often mm -hmm. overlooked. And the fact that it's a whole grain, but it's actually an excellent source of protein and it's actually a complete protein where it has all the amino acids. So um, those are a couple ideas, but it's definitely, I can see the challenge with not caring for beans, how that would be, that would be tough. But in that situation, I'd probably utilize some form of a protein powder, you know, to kind of help fill the gap. Okay. I think we'll get to more questions. We'll keep going. Okay. Um, so with hydration, hydration's next. Like Cherise said, we're all, we're all always, you know, we're, yeah. I don't, I don't even know the nice way to say it, but I'm sure people get tired of hearing us talk about hydration in clinic rooms. Um, but it's so very important. Um, it helps regulate the body temperature. Um, when, for example, like if we have a fever, we see lots of fever, right? Our need for fluid goes up. 
when it also aids for eliminating bacteria and other matters. And when dehydrated, the lymphatic system is less efficient. And the lymphatic system is responsible for helping to eliminate toxins and anything else that our body doesn't need. Um, it helps eliminate it out of the body. So if it's not working properly or efficiently, and we're giving patients chemotherapy and all these extra drugs, um, you know, it's just, it's all going to make everything kind of um, snowball, <laughs> I would say. So it's definitely important to, to hydrate. And like Tree said too, you'll just feel, I, I tell people that so much is like, you would just feel so much better. So you'll so, feel so much better if you hydrate. It's something we totally don't think, we definitely do not think about, but um, when you're hydrated, it makes a major difference. Um, and I know a very common question is how much fluid do we need? Mm -hmm. um, a very easy answer is most people need around two liters, plus or minus some is usually kind of the go-to answer. But if you're wanting a more specific amount, I did put an equation there for you for people that do want to have a more specific kind of guideline. Um, Cause some people, the two liters may be way too much. And some people for two liters is not even going to be enough. It's, you got to also look at the signs of hydration. So there at the bottom, I've included the signs of dehydration. So if you're noticing your urine being a darker yellow, saliva being thick, I know we see that a lot. Um, dry mouth, skin that's slow to return. If you pinch your skin, that's very no uh, slow to return back to normal. All of those are signs of dehydration. So that's the, you know, it's good to kind of think about that two liters, but it's also really important that you pay attention to your own body and you pay attention to those signs of being dehydrated or hydrated. And here are some tips too when it comes to hydration, because I know with taste changes, not feeling well, or just some people are like, I've just never drank much in my life. So I just don't, I'm not, I don't have a good head. I'm not, I don't have a habit of it, you know? So we always have to kind of get creative. And luckily, honestly, my best tips have come from patients. Um, so, you know, one reminder is it does not have to be water. You know, some people have just never cared for water. And while yes, it's the absolute best thing for us, you know, sometimes you just, we gotta get creative. So anything that's liquid at room temperature, and as long as it doesn't have caffeine is gonna help you hydrate. So any of your clear sodas, you know, Sprite, ginger ale, juices, lemonade, sports drinks like Gatorade, Powerade, um, popsicles, Jello, broth, soups, all of those types of things are all going to help you hydrate. And it, you know, so you can't. So I want you to think outside the box of just water. Um, and then choosing foods also that are high in fluids are going to help too. One thing I always really forget about is like oatmeal. You know, you put, say, depending on, you know, how much oatmeal you have, you're adding two thirds of a cup maybe of fluid. Um, that's an easy way to sneak in a little extra liquid. Smoothies and shakes and all those other high fluid, you know, fruits are going to help as well. Um, carry a refillable water bottle, <laughs> but I included, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I'm sure Sharice hears this too, is I have people, will ask people, how, how much are you drinking? They're like, well, I have this with me all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, but how often do you refill it <laughs> is what we need to know, you know, because you can carry it around, but if you don't drink it, you know, so that's important. Make sure you're actually refilling it. Um, and also I find for a lot of people, it helps for them to maybe have a big water bottle to help them know how much they're having, but um, to pour it into a smaller cup to make it look less intimidating. I think if a lot of us can carry a 30 ounce, you know, I've got my 30 ounce pitcher of water right here, but sometimes it'll look so intimidating to somebody, they barely take a sip. But if it's small, they're like, oh, I can drink all that. So I find that that helps a lot of people. I did see a quick question about why do liquids need to be room temperature? And I want to clarify, they don't need to be room temperature. It's just an example of, so basically ice cream, for example, ice cream is technically a liquid because if you were to sit it at room temperature, it would melt to a liquid. Um, so it's really just an example of, of meaning, just remember sorbet, sherbet, ice cream, those popsicles, any of those types of things that are frozen, if you leave them at room temperature, they become a fluid. That means it can help you hydrate. It does not, you certainly don't need to keep all your liquids uh, room temperature. So sorry if that was 
um, confusing. But in addition, flavored water is helpful for a lot of people. I've had people tell me they'll like pour their their liquids into a special glass or a special mug or, you know, they'll pretend it's their little cocktail hour. <laughs> so I think that's always a creative idea. Um, definitely set an alarm. That'll help you. And then, you know, there's actually apps now that you can use that'll help almost make it like a game. Um, the plant nanny, I think, is one that it's kind of like as with each time you drink, you're kind of like watering a plant. <laughs> so I think it just kind of makes it fun. So those are just some ways to kind of help you stay motivated um, in terms of hydration. Do you have any um, other tips, Grace? No, I, you know, I think those are good. We do have somebody that, <laughs> okay, I like this person. They said, use a wine glass. <laughs> I am, <laughs> I yeah. like that. Um, yeah. The other question was somebody was questioning sodas, juices, lemonade, sports drinks because of the high sugar content. And so from my perspective as a provider, you know, a lot depends too um, if you are a diabetic and some other things like that, things in moderation again. So sometimes you might need, you know, some of those sports drinks, um, you have a lot of diarrhea and you're really dehydrated, but no, we, we do not recommend a lot of sugary drinks. Um, yeah. Just, yeah. you don't yeah. want that to be all of what you drink. Not, you don't want to be drinking that two liter Coke bottle a day. Right. Um, right. So yeah, yeah, just to clarify. No, that's good to clarify. Yeah, no, definitely these types of things, hopefully and a lot of, in addition to water and to kind of break it up for a lot of people, I'll say, okay, well, how about you do two cups of water and then you can have one Sprite, you know, and then you have several cups of water and then just to kind of break it up to them to help them achieve their fluid goals. Um, and then, you know, I think also with that said too, is that kind of comes down to being individualized and, you know, you can always do choose diet forms. And a lot of times I'll ideally tell people to water them down. And I think that helps a lot too. Okay. I'm going to move us along. I know we've got a lot of other questions, but it's already... 20 till eight, so. Okay, um, And you know, I will comment on too that I have found, and I know this is true for myself as well, in this past year when we're all wearing masks and you know, together, you don't drink as much. And so it really does take that effort to remember to drink because if you're around other people or you're at work and you're wearing a mask, you do really have to work on it. Yeah. So we're gonna move on a little bit to supplements and how they boost the immune system. And the ones that we're gonna talk about are the ones that we have underlined. Again, I'm gonna say, if you're using a supplement, please let us know um, because it, supplements can um, interact with some of your treatments and we'll run through that, you know, some of that, cause I had a question in there, I see a question in there about that too. What are some of those things we should avoid? Um, but when in doubt, ask your team. For me, when patient brings it to me, I go to our clinical pharmacist, I go to Stephanie and, and ask those questions um, because you never know on that. But vitamin D is something you know that we talk about a lot, especially with myeloma patients. And so vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin that we get from sun exposure and food and supplements. Um, but we don't get as much sun as we used to, right? I know for me and what I tell my patients is make sure you're wearing sunscreen and sun protective clothing, um, but you still need a little bit of sun to help that natural process. It's, you know, vitamin D, it's converted in the liver and then again in the kidney before coming this active form. So if you're not getting sun, um, it can make it a little challenging. So it's, it's a balance there. Um, it's crucial in bone health. And again, in myeloma, we have bone issues. And so it does promote calcium absorption. It helps play a role in osteoclast activity. And I'm gonna talk a little bit um, more about that. There's some question about vitamin D on immune cells and their role in immunity. Um, you know, with COVID, you know, there was a lot of recommendations and I know from our critical care colleagues, they were re recommending vitamin D and giving vitamin D in COVID patients. So there is something to be said for that from that immune perspective. Um, you know, low vitamin D can cause fatigue. Um, we see vitamin D deficiencies all the time, right? Older adults, limited, limited sun exposure, um, darker skin, so um, more um, melanin in your skin that if 
you see less sun absorption in there. Fat, malabsorption, obesity, and people who have had gastric bypass as well. And there was a study that demonstrated that the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency was actually greater in African-Americans versus whites, but African-Americans had lower rates of fractures and osteoporosis. Um, there's a question about what is the optimal vitamin D level. And I know years ago, you know, your primary care, everybody was getting thrown on high doses of vitamin D. And then the recommendations backed off a little bit. And so, you know, it's something in myeloma that we should monitor, whether it's us, your primary care, or your endocrinologist, somebody should be looking at it. And one of those reasons is because many of you are on bone agents, right? So vitamin D, if it impacts your bone health and osteoclast activity, let's just talk about that for a moment. We all have normal bone remodeling. So you have osteoclasts that break down bone and then it puts it in the system for reabsorption. And then you have osteoblasts that come behind to re rebuild bone. With active myeloma, you get the osteoclasts breaking down bone, but you don't always get that rebuilding osteoblast behind it. And that's why you get bone lesions, you get fractures, and that's why we give bone agents. So that somata, pomidronate, denosumab, um, for you. Now, when we give you those Asia agents, it drops your calcium levels and drops your vitamin D levels. And so most of us, when we start these drugs, we do put you on a vitamin D supplement, just an over-the-counter um, vitamin D, um, and should monitor your levels. And we forget sometimes. And for some patients, they need to be on a vitamin D and calcium supplement as well. There are some contraindications with calcium supplements, so it is something to talk to your team about whether you need to be on a calcium uh, supplement as well. But it's just something to think about and for us to um, look at as well. We used to do a lot of bone density scans. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about myeloma, but it does tell you about osteoporosis, and so those thinning of the bones. We've backed off those, and we're letting primary care or endocrine again do that and you know we're sticking more with myeloma but it's just something to think about with your bone health for vitamin d mm -hmm. um, supplements you can get it sources and cod liver oil right i mean this was a big thing like for my mother's generation i mean she said she had to take a tablespoon of that she knew exactly what i was talking about but other things fish egg yolk um, some mushrooms that were exposed to UV light, you always have to be careful about mushrooms, um, fortified milk, um, but getting some sunlight, you know, it could be a couple times a week or, you know, for a period of time, you know, 20 minutes or so, it says five to 30 minutes here, you know, a couple times a week really does wonders. And um, so think about that, but, you know, we're not recommending that you spend too much time in the sun unprotected. Um, some recommended doses, these come in international units, and you can see that for ages, um, great one to 70 and greater than 70. And then supplements, we have D2 and D3. Um, we typically prescribe D3, um, you know, both can work, but there are st studies that show that D3 actually increases the blood levels higher and maintains it a little bit higher. Um, you do wanna avoid high dose for a long time. And if you're prescribed by your team or your endocrinologist, sometimes they go with really big doses if you're really low for a period of time. It's not a forever kind of thing. So just to keep that in mind, long exposure to high dose can actually increase calcium levels in your blood as can myeloma. So it's just something, you know, something else to watch, something else to look forward um, with that. And I will say like, with that said too, because I, I see several questions about D, the appropriate supplementation for vitamin D. I think mm -hmm. you know, it goes back to knowing what your level is, um, finding out from a practitioner how much to supplement, um, because we certainly have seen cases of elevated calcium blood levels from high amounts of vitamin D supplementation. So, um, mm -hmm. And of course, the first concern is, oh no, is this something to do with the myeloma? You know, so it's just definitely something we've definitely seen over supplementation of it. Um, and I think right now with COVID and that being a much more popular 
supplement is definitely something to continue to make sure that you're talking to your teams about. Yeah. And I just real quick, because there are some questions about mushrooms, um, your regular old mushroom you're fine with, you know, your portobello, the, you know, your white button mushroom. Um, I'm thinking of mushrooms in the wild that you found, or somebody brings you the brown mushroom powder supplement. Um, you right. just have to be careful with some of those things the, you yeah. know, your basic, I bought, bought mushrooms at the farmer's market that I cook with and you're fine. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, all right. Did you want me to pick up here? Yes. For vitamin C. Okay. I know we're running it. We're running out of time. So we're going to try to keep things moving. Um, next to, to discuss would be vitamin C. Uh, this definitely is a supplement. I see a lot of supplementation of, I always, I've always, we, I think we've always seen a lot of vitamin C supplementation mm -hmm. in the population, um, but certainly with COVID, I think it's ramped up a lot. Um, but it is an antioxidant, plays a role in growth and function of immune cells, has a role in anti antibody production as well. Um, what's very interesting is population data does suggest that dietary vitamin C intake um, is linked to reduced cancer risk um, and specifically reduced cancer related mortality in men um, in some studies. But, and you can absolutely easily get adequate amount of vitamin C through your diet. For example, you know, I have the RDAs there. And for example, half a cup of peppers provides 100% of your daily need for vitamin C. So it's certainly something that is very easy to obtain through our diet. Um, and what's even more interesting is that even though we see this benefit of dietary vitamin C and cancer risk, we don't see that same benefit when it comes to supplements. Um, it's been studied over and over and, you know, it's, we still don't see that same benefit. So that's just something always to keep in mind, which is also why most of the time you're going to hear a lot of dietitians really try to recommend diet first versus supplements because almost always diet is more powerful than supplements. Um, probably because nutrients probably work together to provide those benefits. But anyways, um, there are studies showing that high dose oral vitamin C has not improved survival and have not decreased disease progression, because um, that's another popular thing we've seen. One interesting thing, though, is there is preliminary evidence suggesting high doses of IV, vi IV vitamin C, so given intravenously, may have a benefit on survival rate only in some patients with advanced terminal disease. So you want to just keep in mind that these are poorly designed studies. I'm not saying that they're not accurate, but they, and they're very small. So we're talking subjects of studies of 15 subjects. Um, and again, they had very progressive terminal disease. So this isn't something I would, you know, go and run and recommend right now. There is an interesting um, clinical trial open right now on high dose IV vitamin C, specifically in people with relapsed refractory myeloma. Um, and it is open right now. I want to say it's in the recruitment phase. And the hope is that in some of the studies they've done so far is that by doing these high dose IV vitamin C, and we're talking 50 to 60 grams daily, um, or 50 to 60 grams IV, um, has been shown to help basically make people more sensitive to a drug that they grew a resistance to. So it's very interesting and hopeful, but we have no idea. So I don't you know, stay tuned for results. I don't want anybody running around trying to immediately go get some IV vitamin C because we have no idea. We do not know if it'll be beneficial or harmful. Okay, but it is definitely potentially exciting. Um, vitamin C contraindications. So on that note, there are a lot of vitamin C con or contraindications, including if you're in radiation, we always recommend discontinuing vitamin C as it can interact. It can basically prevent benefits of radiation. Certain chemotherapies like Velcade, Carfilzomib, if you have something called G6PD deficiency, which is an enzyme deficiency, vitamins, high doses of vitamin C have been shown to cause hemolytic anemia. Um, if you have something called hemochromatosis, where you have excessive iron stores, this is also contraindicated. Um, in some people with frequent histories of kidney stones, vitamin C has also been shown to exacerbate that. So people, there are people that are more at risk for vitamin C deficiencies, such as people that smoke, 
and stage kidney failure that are on dialysis. And I've certainly seen that firsthand for sure. Um, and then people with just preferences or intakes of limited fruits and vegetables. Um, so I think with, you know, that said, you, again, this is just a reminder that for some people, vitamin C may be beneficial. And for some people, you're going to see potential harm done for it. So I think a lot of times we think nutrition, it can't hurt. I'm just going to pop this supplement and it, it absolutely can be harmful. So you absolutely need to, you know, run things by your team. Um, next is zinc. This is an essential mineral found to have a role in the immune system. Even a mild deficiency has been associated with a defects in the immune, res immune response, excuse me. Um, and decreased levels, there was a study recently, I wanna say it was in 2018, um, that found that decreased levels of zinc were found in those diagnosed with stage one multiple myeloma. Um, I will say I have not seen personally a more frequent um, rate of zinc deficiency in our population. I certainly check it periodically based on people's symptoms. Um, zinc deficiency symptoms would be altered sense of taste, which of course now with COVID, that's, <laughs> that's makes things more complicated, but that we see a lot or decreased appetite. We see a lot with zinc deficiencies. So often we'll check it, but I won't say that I personally have seen it more frequently in this population. Um, now, it has antiviral properties. I think we've all heard probably that it can, it plays a role um, with the common cold and helping decrease um, the severity of symptoms if taken immediately or how quickly it's taken. Um, and it's hypothesized that it may play a role in prevention and treatment of COVID, but I was hoping to talk about this later. And then if we have time, and then excess supplementation can absolutely result in copper deficiency. So you should never exceed more than 50, millig 50 milligrams of elemental zinc daily. Um, and we always recommend discontinuing after three to four weeks so that you do not develop a copper deficiency. Um, An intranasal form of that has been associated with the loss of sense of smell. So we no longer recommend that. Um, I see there have been some questions about turmeric or curcumin. This is the yellow pigment of the turmeric plant that's often used in the Indian traditional herbal medicines, commonly used for infection, inflammation, cancer, has a lot of antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties. Um, it is often seen in multiple myeloma. Um, I see this in a lot of patients that have used it um, because it has in some studies demonstrated basically cytotoxic effect on myeloma activity in, in small studies. Um, so it does have some potential benefits, but again, not enough that we really know too much about. There was one really exciting study recently, just last year, that it was only done in 15 patients. So it's very small, but it was a study of 15 patients and those that were not tolerating DEX, they discontinued the DEX and in place of it, um, put them on turmeric. Um, or the curcumin, and I forget the dose, but it had very um, beneficial effects on it. So in these patients, so I mean, there's definitely some potential promising, you know, um, data out there, but still, that was only 15 patients. Um, so you know, it's just something to keep an eye out on. And something to kind of know about curcumin is it's very poorly absorbed. So most of the time, in order to get a potential benefit from it. People have to be getting a lot of curcumin in, and yeah. to help the absorption, they have to eat more fat in something called piperine, which is actually comes from black pepper. And the downside to increasing those things, it actually increases the absorption of other drugs. So, and people, some people will go, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the problem is, is with the increased absorption of those drugs, you're increasing the absorption and causing more side effects for yourself. So it can be very dangerous. So that's just something absolutely to kind of take into consideration. Um, and then contraindications would include blood thinners because turmeric or curcumin does have a natural blood thinning effect. Um, and it is metabolized in similar pathways as many of the drugs that are utilized. So I know we as a team generally, you know, depending on what treatment somebody's on, we, we really recommend discontinuing it for a lot of patients. Do you have something to say, Sharice? 
No, no, I, I agree. And it's it just, again, you have to take so much of it to really get the impact that most people can't consume that much um, at low doses for most of our patients. We're okay with it. But um, I mean, we good. are at, we have like, oh. yes. Um, so do we want to kind of zip through this real quick? Because we have a ton of questions and I hate not to get to the questions. Um, that do, I, should we just go to questions or do you want to zip, you want to try zipping through it real fast? We can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Stephanie, Stephanie and Cherise, I, I yep. think that this is so, it's so important. So go ahead, breathe, do your slides. I think we should finish this up. If okay. anyone needs to jump off of the call, we totally understand that. But let's let's finish this out and, and take some questions. We could go over a little bit. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. Um, so real quickly, I mean not real quickly, but anyways, we will talk about nutrition and COVID, what we know or what we still don't know, because this is still all so new and evolving. Um, but certainly when it comes to nutrition and COVID nineteen, I did want to talk about it because I do think that this has just ramped up such an a new interest, I think, in nutrition and how it impacts immunity, because I think that's something a lot of people felt like they can control in a situation that is, you know, we, we had very little control of. Um, so, you know, when it comes to risk factors for severe COVID-19, they found that obesity, diabetes, and hypertension appear to be risk factors for severe cases of this. Um, you're more likely to require hospitalization. One theory is that, you know, well, why is this, right? Of course, we're wondering, well, why does that have this, this effect? Well, one theory is that, you know, with higher intakes of saturated fats or higher fat diets, you would ha maybe have a higher, you know, body weight, et cetera. This leads to that chronic activation of the innate immune system we kind of talked about earlier, um, which then is just going to you know, make the immune system almost kind of worn out by the time it's, it's time to get started. Um, and there's been a study showing that high fat diet in mice ac actually increases um, macrophages infiltration of the lungs, which is something that was kind of seen with COVID-19. So it's just something that is maybe a correlation, a potential association. Um, and then this high fat diet, the intake of our higher fat, higher saturated fat diet leads to suppression of the adaptive immune system. So the immune system that's supposed to be there to kind of swing in and ca catch the, the pathogens that get past those first lines of um, first lines of defense those are suppressed. So for those reasons they feel like maybe these these have you know exacerbated these cases of COVID-19. Um, but, you know, there's still obviously so much to learn when it comes to that. Now, specific nutrients, you know, that have been very interesting, have become, people have been much more interested in is vitamin D. Um, vitamin D, the reason for the interest has been that low vitamin D may be an independent risk factor for COVID-19 infection and hospitalization. Um, initially, there was a lot of data showing this, you know, association. However, with time over these last several months, there seems to be a little bit more conflicting data. And I think this probably goes back to what we talked about with vitamin D before is I think a lot of times, well, do we even know the right vitamin D level for everybody? We probably don't. Um, so, you know, I think there's still a lot to be learned when it comes to this, um, but there's still a lot of experts that are still, you know, because of the potential association and because most Americans are such a high number of us are deficient in vitamin D are still recommending supplementing about 2000 international units of vitamin D. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still to be determined. Um, but I do think that's probably a safe a dose for most people, right, Cherise? Yeah. And I was going to mention that as well. We've got several questions about dosing. And so typically if I'm starting a patient that they're borderline, I just do the over the counter 2000, international units um, and then monitor every couple months the level just to see where we are. There are a lot of questions about varying doses and maybe your provider has you on a higher dose or a lower dose. And that's really going to be based on your levels. Um, somebody mm -hmm. else asked, where do I find that? That is not something routine. I mean, that is something extra that um, we would draw and it would show up as your vitamin D. So, you know,
know, if you've not had that, it, you know, it'd be worth asking. Um, somebody else made a comment about the Exiva and being on a calcium supplement with their vitamin D. Um, denosumab is the other name. Um, you're absolutely right. Denosumab, Exiva does make myeloma patients in particular bottom out on calciums. <laughs> so unless you're getting it for hypercalcemia for your myeloma, that's different. But typically we do load patients up with calcium and usually vitamin D as well when they're on that. Okay. Um, and then when vitamin K, another, you know, interesting nutrient, I don't, I'm sorry if my camera is doing something weird. I don't know why. Um, is that vitamin K levels have been, that they found low vitamin K levels that were significantly associated with a poor prognosis. Um, and then, but it is unknown if vitamin K supplementation will actually improve outcomes. Um, can you see, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're losing you. Um, I'm going to let you work on that. I'll keep going. How's that? Okay. Um, the thing with vitamin K is we don't typically, oh, we lost her. We'll let her get back in there. The thing with vitamin K that you do need to be careful with, that you don't want to increase it if you're taking warfarin or Coumadin. Um, I can't think of a time, vitamin K is not something that I typically recommend to patients. Um, if you're getting it in just that general vitamin, um, that's fine. I'm gonna keep us going here. Um, so things that we uh, know, hopefully Stephanie will be able to call back in. Um, with vitamin C, I think we've kind of covered that. Um, there are some experts that still suggest supplementing. Um, again, you know, for me, most people can get what they need in a multivitamin unless they're deficient. And then we ask them to do that just because we see the vitamin C interactions. You, we so frequently use proteasome inhibitors. Um, don't usually have them taking extra zinc. Um, you can, you know, you've got those little zinc tablets, especially if you feel like you're getting a cold, um, that can be helpful. Um, zinc is found in meat, poultry, fish. Um, there's no evidence related to COVID-19. I mean, we're still learning so much um, from that. And I agree with Stephanie in that most of these things I would rather our patients get in foods as well. And that goes with potassium and magnesium when we can. Um, just I'll keep, I'll answer another question as I'm going. Somebody wrote in about um, caffeinated drinks and why they don't count when we were looking at hydration. Caffeine is actually dehydrating. And so if you're drinking caffeinated beverages, you actually need to drink some more um, uncaffeinated to make up for it. So it doesn't mean that you can't have your cup of coffee in the morning or your tea. Um, it's just not all that you wanna drink through the day. Um, so supplements and COVID-19 advisory, and I'm sorry, these were this was Stephanie's section on this, but products being marketed as able to boost your immune function, um, I can answer that. There just is no good data around this. And I get this question a lot from myeloma patients that, hey, somebody said, if I take this, it's going to boost my immune system. You know, we're always looking for where's the data and where's the scientific data for it. So you know, when in doubt about any kind of supplement, please ask your team on that. But there's nothing that we know of to treat or prevent um, or cure um, COVID or other viral infections from that standpoint. Um, the other thing is um, just as far as nutrition goes, um, decreasing intakes of saturated fats and sugar. I feel like we covered this a little bit. There's just not that time that they're going to tell you to eat high fat, high sugar diets. Again, we go back to everything in um, moderation from that standpoint. Um, severe cases of illness can result from that elevated pro-inflammatory cytokine release um, with acute respiratory distress. And so these are those things to decrease to help with, with that. So increased um, intakes of fiber, whole grains, unsaturated fats, fruits, these are the things that are always good for you. Um, fish gives you that omega-3 and vegetables give you those antioxidants. 
So again, supplement responsibly, ask your team. You got a you know, whole team of people around you for that. And remember with vitamin C that you can have those interactions as well as green tea um, with proteasome inhibitors. And so you do wanna be careful with that. Um, turmeric and other blood thinners, keep that in mind, especially at those high doses with turmeric um, to avoid. The other thing that has, maybe not so much to do with interactions that we're talking about today, but I think somebody had asked a question, are there other things from a myeloma patient standpoint and treatment that we should avoid? Um, venetoclax, you know, we're using that a lot more in patients and also in clinical trials. So something to keep in mind with that is grapefruit juice. Um, you never, you just want to avoid grapefruit juice with venetoclax. It has what's called a CYP interaction. So the way you metabolize it, it can make drugs speed up or slow down. And so you can get higher doses or, or not get the dose that you need. And quite honestly, there isn't a hospital out there, I, I think, that carries grapefruit juice. And I believe that was a question as well. It interacts with so many medications that typically we have patients just avoid grapefruit juice. Um, the other things with venetoclax would be Seville oranges. They're used, they're bitter, they're to make um, marmalade. St. John's wort, there are a lot of contraindications with St. John's wort. So that is something that you always want to ask your team about. And then some other medications. So <laughs> this is talking about food safety. Um, you know, again, we said cancer and treatments weaken your immune system. And, and I saw a question in there asking, but if you strengthen the immune system, are you also strengthening the, strengthening the myeloma cells? And the answer is no to that. You know, we're strengthening those normal immune function, and we actually want to use your immune system to help us fight myeloma. Um, as far as current food handling and consumption, you know, we know that this has not been associated with COVID-19. And while there have been, you know, outbreaks at food facilities, it had nothing to do with the virus spreading to consumers through food. The things that you do want to keep in mind, though, are they still have outbreaks of things like salmonella um, or E. coli. And so thinking about produce and um, things like that, that, you know, proper storage, proper washing, proper handling, um, getting our food online um, and delivery, those things, um, I think most of us have kind of liked some of that. Um, you know, we're recommending that our patients follow CDC guidelines. So we know that you can go to the store, they're still recommended that you wear a mask, even if you're vaccinated, um, keeping your distance and washing your hands. And 20 seconds is the key to washing your hands. And if you sing happy birthday to me twice, that is about 20 seconds. Um, so sanitizing, and we know this works because if you look at the flu season that we really didn't have, it's because we were keeping our hands out of our face and we were washing our hands. And so these same precautions that have just been drilled into us, our patients were already doing most of those things, but you can see what a difference it made um, this past year. Um, so, you know, when you're handling foods, you know, washing your hands, um, disinfecting the counters, you can make your own, you know, there was that time period where you couldn't get these things, right? So a third a cup of bleach mixed with a gallon of water and leave it on the surface for a minute, wipe it down and, um, okay, Stephanie looks like she's on there. So I'm going to finish this one and then we'll get her back in here. Um, you. are you there? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Reusable grocery bags. I know stores weren't letting us do that for a while. I think they're back to it. If you know, especially with the nylon ones and that that you can um, wash. And Stephanie, you want to take over here? Sure. Um, I am so sorry about that. I hope everyone can hear me. I just had to dial in through the phone. Um, yep, we can hear. You. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I think this kind of just reiterates a lot of what you have already discussed um, in regards to obtaining food safely with takeout and pickup, um, and, and you already did a great job explaining, yeah, the, this is always going to probably be helpful and, you know, um, pertinent in terms of any kind of cold and flu season. These are just ways that we can decrease our exposure to other germs. 
um, on pathogens. Now, mm -hmm. in terms of continuing to keep the food safe after you've acquired it, say, from your grocery store, um, you know, the, the, this is very important. I always kind of, you know, just think we overlook the importance of this, but um, in general, our food is very safe. But once we get it home, I think we as consumers um, you know, forget about our own responsibility of keeping it safe. Um, so what can we do to keep our food, you know, keep our food safe once we have it? First of all, clean your hands and surfaces often. Um, make sure you're separating. So never, ever, you know, allow raw meat or raw poultry, et cetera, touch fresh produce, particularly produce that you're not going to cook. So as that's, you know, one of the leading causes of foodborne illnesses is when food has touched each other. I would say I most commonly see this probably at the grocery store, like people buy some meat and they'll put some, like, lettuce on top of the meat in their grocery cart. Um, you know, you need to keep those separate or else you, you are really increasing that risk of getting sick. Um, you can't always tell if a food is, you know, cooked all the way through just by how it looks or how it smells. It's so important to have a good thermometer. I always suggest having at, least, having at least two so you can, you know, double check if you're not sure if, you know, you check it once and you're, you're kind of questioning whether it's all the way cooked or not. And you can go to foodsafety.gov to find the actual safe temperatures to cook those foods at. Um, and then chilling foods properly. You, got, you have to chill foods within one hour if it's over 90 degrees outside or within two hours of cooking um, otherwise. So you have to get foods into the refrigerator in, or into the refrigerator within two hours. And then this is another big one I think a lot of people still probably don't, you know, do correctly is thawing our foods properly. So there are safe ways to thaw food and there are unsafe ways. The safest way is either thawing in the refrigerator, which takes a lot of planning in advance, um, Thawing under running cold water has been shown to be a safe, faster way to thaw our food. Or you can thaw in the microwave. If you ever thaw in the microwave, though, you do need to cook the food immediately. You cannot um, kind of say, oh, I'm going to thaw this, and then I'll just put it in the fridge and cook it another day. Um, I don't see why anybody would do that, but I think there's times where, okay, I'm going to start thawing something and then I change my mind. <laughs> so if you start thawing in the microwave, you do need to make sure that you then cook it all the way through that day um, in order to thaw it properly and keep it a safe temperature. Um, next, this is just kind of a modified um, chart summarizing the FDA's recommendations for cancer patients. Um, like Cherie said, this is what we, you know, we recommend the CDC guidelines here. We recommend the FDA guidelines when it comes to food safety. Now, this is something I know that we both probably get a lot of questions about because every institution is different when it comes to what they're advising their patients in terms of keeping food safe um, when your counts are low. Now, this is what our institution has adopted. Um, we have certainly kind of loosened our restrictions gradually over the years because the few studies that have been done when it comes to this topic has shown that actually the more restrictive we are when it comes to food safety, meaning, you know, when we used to follow what we call the neutropenic diet, which didn't allow any fresh fruits, any fresh vegetables, any source of bacteria, um, those patients actually tend to have a slightly higher rates of infection than those who follow more of the food safety guidelines. So because of that information, we now have this recommendation of, you know, you want to avoid these higher risk foods, foods that are most likely to have a foodborne illness outbreak. So higher risk being soft cheeses made from unpasteurized milk, undercooked meats or poultry, refrigerated smoked seafood, raw or undercooked fish, so we're talking sushi, um, cold or underheated hot dogs. Um, so yes, you can have hot dogs, but they need to be reheated and they need to be steaming hot. You, cold cuts, unfortunately, are not recommended because they are higher risk for listeria. Um, and we actually did, I want to say, in this last year, have an outbreak of listeria in lunch meat. 
Um, so if you want lunch meats, you want to make sure that you cook, you want to cook them. So I always suggest doing something like a hot ham and cheese and just making sure that that ham gets real, like steaming hot. Or you do, you know, a Reuben where you get that meat really, really hot. Um, when it comes to eggs, we want the eggs cooked all the way through. And then when it comes to produce, we recommend here at our institution, based on the FDA's recommendations, that you can have fresh produce. It just needs to be washed underwater for 30 seconds. Um, use agitation when you can to just kind of rub anything off that you can. Um, but you don't need to use any sprays. You know, you don't need to use any vinegar. Um, you can use vinegar. You absolutely can, but, you know, you really don't need to. Um, you just want to make sure you're rinsing it, and it can be organic and it, or it can be not organic. It's, either one is perfectly fine when it comes to food safety. Um, and then lastly, higher risk are your raw or undercooked sprouts, meaning those kind of grass-looking sprouts because the salmonella can actually be inside of the, the seed, so you can't rinse those away. So they have to, if you're going to have sprouts, you have to cook them. Here are just a list of resources. Um, about food safety that I recommend everybody, you know, take a look at because, again, I think, you know, we a lot of times kind of take for granted when we do get our food, we then kind of forget to keep it safe once we have it in our own hands. So this is just a great, you know, great resources that you can look up to kind of especially kind of look up, say, the safe temperature um, when cooking those meats, those types of things. That's where you can find this information. Um, and in summary, you know, okay, so let's go back to our first question is, can you boost the immune system, you know, with our diet and our supplement? Um, you know, no, you cannot boost it, right? But, you, you know, does putting extra gas in the car make it work faster or make it work better? No. But you can support and optimize the immune system by giving it what it needs in order to work properly and to work optimally. So you need Feed it adequate calories, feed it adequate protein. You need to eat, limit your intake of sugar and saturated fats. Limit or increase the variety of the vegetables, fruits, whole grains that you're eating. Make sure you hydrate. Um, I certainly think it's reasonable for everybody to request a vitamin D level um, so that they can supplement appropriately. And then when it comes to vitamin C, you know, again, because that is something that we just see so often. I think it can be done reasonably and responsibly um, during this time, say, you know, or say during cold and flu season, those types of things. But it always, always needs to be discussed with, you know, your whole team to make sure that there's no contraindications. Make sure that you're looking at your own past medical history. Make sure you're looking at your... Um, your medications to make sure that there's no at potential adverse effects of taking that. Um, and then additionally, make sure you're staying active, make sure you're sleeping well, and make sure you're de-stressing and taking care of that mental well-being because all of those things are important for, you know, optimizing our immune system. Yep. All right. I think these are the references. And thank you so much for joining us. I, I'm sorry that we've just not been able to get to all of your questions, but um, we appreciate you joining us tonight. Sherry, Rob, you and, Sherry, you and Stephanie did an amazing job, and we're always so very, very grateful. This was truly a lot of information to absorb, speaking of absorbing all of these things. But I'm glad that we've recorded this webinar tonight so that all of you can listen to it again. Uh, maybe some of the support groups can also uh, do the replay at their meetings. And so as a reminder, this replay as well as all IMF replays are available at myloma.org. Just click on the IMF videos. I would think have this uh, video up and ready for you to listen to again early next week. A couple of uh, quick reminders that our support groups continue to safely meet virtually. So please check the IMS website to find one near you. And then don't forget, 
the IMF wonderful info line. Uh, Missy, Paul, Judy are happy to take your calls. That toll-free number is 1-800-452-2873. And they are available Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, most importantly, thanks to all of you for joining us today. And a very, very, very special thanks to our speakers, Sharif and Stephanie. And again, our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squid, Jansen, Uncropeptized, and Takeda. I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and be well. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>